This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, I think we'll start. Um, I'm Professor Pamela Scully, uh, Assistant Vice Provost for Academic Innovation uh, and a professor in the College in Women's Studies and African Studies. And I'm one of the co-organizers of this Emory Ebola Faculty and Community Forum, along with Sita Ranjit Nilsson of the Institute for Developing Nations and Deb Brunner of the School of Nursing. Um, and I really want to thank the Institute for Developing Nations for taking on all the organizing responsibilities for this forum, and particularly Keisha, thank you so much. Um, today we are talking about Ebola and the law in the US and West Africa, treatment, vaccine development, and ethics. Uh, before we start, I just want to let you know of our future forums, so I'm going to make sure I know the right dates. So March 3rd, which is coming up soon, uh, we, it's going to be at the Candler School of Theology. We are moving around each time so that we uh, are in one of the schools that um, help sponsor. So it'll be in the Rita Ann Rollins Building, room 252, and that topic is going to be on religion. Um, the speakers for that week will be John Blevins from Rollins School of Public Health, Jehu Hansile, Candler School of Theology, and Emmanuel Lati, also the Candler School of Theology. Um, and after that, the next one will be on March 23rd, after the break, um, at the School of Medicine, room 110, and that topic will be perspe perspectives from institutional partners. Um, and then President Carter is coming on April 9th uh, to talk about Ebola, democracy, human rights, and public health. Um, we're very, very grateful that he will be, President Carter will be being, participating in this forum. Um, and then there's a final wrap-up session as well. So today, we are very lucky to have two distinguished professors from Emory talking. Polly Price is Professor of Law at Emory and teaches and writes in the areas of public health law, immigration and regulatory and administrative law. Professor Price is the author of two books and numerous articles on American legal history, citizenship, property rights and the judiciary. She's the recipient of a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant in public health law and has worked with the US-Mexico Border Health Commission on legal issues related to tuberculosis control. Um, Professor Price has also been one of the innovators of various online courses and is also participating in the Ebola Coursera course. Um, and then Paul Root Wolpe uh, is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics, the Raymond F. Shinazi Distinguished Research Chair in Jewish Bioethics, and a professor in the Departments of Medicine, Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Sociology, and finally, director of the Center for Ethics at Emory University. He is the author of over 125 articles, editorials, and book chapters in a variety of disciplines, sociology, medicine, and bioethics, and has contributed to a variety of encyclopedias on bioethical issues. Dr. Wolpe also serves as the first senior bioethicist for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, known as NASA, where he's responsible for formulating policy on bioethical issues and safeguarding research subjects. So today's forum will be from now until around five o'clock. Um, our speakers will, will uh, give their presentations and there will be time for questions. Um, and after that, the faculty discussion group will move to the other building. We will just follow Keisha, I think. And um, because of uh, Professor Wolpe's work with NASA, he, uh, he will have to leave a little earlier at, at 5.30, but we are very glad to have him here. So, Professor Price, will you start us off? With apologies to the late Gabriel Garcia Marquez for borrowing the title from Love in the Time of Cholera, I'm, t I'm calling this uh, Law in the Time of Ebola. And in my defense, it is somewhat apt borrowing because what I will say in the next 20 minutes applies not just to Ebola, but it would apply to cholera, it would apply to vaccines for measles, it would apply to any number of other infectious diseases as well. This is because my topic is the use of government authority to control contagious disease. Ebola is an example of how public health is bounded by both law and government functions. 
Remember this phrase because I'm going to repeat it at the end. Plans versus panic. We want the plans to win. We're going to think about law more broadly than you might otherwise. The study of law is about rights and duties and how they are enforced, but it's also about how laws are produced and how through better law we can also have better government and better results. This is a brief overview of how public health law is made, at least to the extent I can do so in uh, 20 minutes, and an overview of how state government and agencies administer that law. Public health law is diffuse because it involves a wide array of government actors in a variety of subjects. It governs health providers like Emory Hospital, for example, directing what it can and cannot do. Just one example, the Federal Occupational, Self, Se, Occupational Safety and Health Administration sets safety standards to protect hospital workers, and more than one government agency issues rules for the disposal of hazardous waste from healthcare facilities. So many areas of law are involved. What we learn about government response to contagious disease might be that it is inadequate lack of coordination between federal, state, and local health uh, departments, each with their own, each agency with their own law, procedures, and specific charge, and all of these, though, have a key role in containing effect, uh, infectious disease. So first, I will briefly outline some of the laws and government agencies relevant to the containment of infectious disease through the recent experience of Ebola. And I think um, Emory is a good place to Start, and this is where it started for Emory, at least within the state of Georgia, and that's when uh, the plane arrived carrying the first Ebola patient. It, um, this is, in fact, a complicated journey, and I'll take us on a little bit of this journey, but in terms of how that patient got to Emory, it took a negotiating international law, sovereignty of other nations, U.S. federal law and regulations, and U.S. state and local law and regulations. And don't worry, I'm not going through all of these with you, but what I wanted to point out is the context. So for Emory to be able to treat this patient, you had to hit the sweet spot where those overlap, okay, negotiating um, all of those. So my focus today is really going to be law in the United States, but I want to set the stage with a brief overview of international law, the World Health Organization, has its strengths and weaknesses, as we know. It is like the CDC for the world in the sense that it provides expertise and advice, uh, but it lacks an enforcement, an effective enforcement uh, mechanism for what we will uh, look at briefly, the international health regulations. So the World Health Organization declared the Ebola virus epidemic a public health emergency of international concern, and what that means is that the international health regulations then come into effect. Well, what are they? They are uh, designed to help the international community um, prevent and respond to acute public health risks that have the potential to cross borders and threaten people worldwide. This is only the third time that the World Health Organization has declared a global health emergency. This is a legally binding treaty the international health regulations. There are 194 signatory countries. It requires countries to report certain public health events and disease outbreaks, and it applies to uh, political, diplomatic, and trade relationships among these uh, companies, countries. But state parties often violate these by unnecessarily restricting travel and trade. We saw that with the swine flu epidemic in, Mexico and North America in 2009. The recommendations from the World Health Organization in that event were to refrain from closing borders and restricting international traffic and trade, and yet uh, that's exactly what we've seen with the Ebola virus. Now, in terms of uh, other actors, we have the UN mission uh, for Ebola emergency response. That was established after the unanimous adoption of uh, General Assembly and Security Council resolutions. Now, this too was unprecedented. The resolution for the UN Security Council 
was sponsored by 130 countries. That's the highest level of support for any Security Council resolution in the history of the UN. The resolution called on member nations to lift travel and border restrictions in the Ebola-affected regions of West Africa and to step up their response to the disease because they termed it a threat to international peace and security. So the members of the UN Security Council urged all nations to maintain trade and transport with those countries most affected by the Ebola outbreak. Uh, they expressed their continued concern about the detrimental effect of the isolation of those countries, including the possibility of uh, long-term economic harm as well as the possibility of failed states. Well, with the World Health Organization, their experience and our experience with them we have a restructuring and a reform opportunity. We're very close to the point at which we can focus on lessons learned for how to handle the beginning of a public health crisis like this. Uh, what, again, what are we balancing? We're balancing international trade, health security, and human rights. And all of these have different sources of law and different governing bodies. So this is uh, some images from the World Health Organization with, their inter with the international health regulations. Five reasons why they matter. Health threats have no borders. We don't need to, uh, we don't need to convince anyone in this room of that, of that fact. Um, why is global governance of health so difficult, though? Why is, why is that governance so difficult? And the answer is national borders. Nations are responsible for and in control of health matters within their borders. Here are some images that I want to share with you from West Africa. What prevents this from happening here in the United States? What do we need to know to avoid this here? Here is a use of government authority to control contagious epidemic disease. How much government authority is too much? How much is too little? And how do our public health laws in the United States strike the right balance? We don't know because we haven't yet been tested by a full-scale epidemic of a very scary disease. Part of emergency preparedness, though, is legal preparedness. Government officials and private partners informed and well-placed to implement government intervention when necessary. So while it's not traditionally viewed as part of public health law, the immigration and border control laws of individual nations are directly relevant to the threat of pandemic disease. In the United States, immigration and border control officers may refuse to admit any U.S. Non, any non-U.S. citizen infected with a contagious disease of public health significance. U.S. citizens, on the other hand, cannot be refused re-entry into the country although officials can order immediate isolation. They don't get to choose where they would go. So uh, they can't be refused reentry. Um, they can be immediately isolated, and they, the federal government can prohibit air travel for the period during which uh, that patient could easily spread the disease. So now we're back on the road to Emory with the first patient, how they got here. For the first two Ebola patients transferred from Liberia to the Emory Hospital, both had a right of return on the basis of their citizenship, but not a right to choose where they could travel within the United States. Hence, the cooperative effort of Emory Hospital officials, the CDC, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the Federal Aviation Administration, and Georgia public health officials paved the way for that transfer. The Liberian government, incidentally, also agreed to the transportation plans for those first two American patients. Normally, a nation cannot prevent a non-citizen from leaving, uh, but it can do so for health and safety reasons. It can at least limit travel within that country. So the Liberian government could have prevented movement of any patients out of local isolation uh, or quarantine if travel within that country posed undue health risks for others. There are lots of um, heroes in this story, and many deserve a rightful celebration for Emory's successful treatment and its pioneering role here. Uh, but I want to add one more to this, and this is uh, introducing you to Emory Law alumni Randy Davis. 
He is vice president and general counsel of Phoenix Air. He is also a pilot, has flown several Ebola patients from West Africa to the US, including to Emory. Phoenix Air Group is the only air transportation company with the capability to transport Ebola patients because it has CDC and Department of Defense approved containment systems and it's the only one that does. And so all of the evacuations from the United States to the United States have been by Phoenix Air and Phoenix Air has also um, performed a, no a number of evacuations to Europe. The, um, in addition to advance approval by the State Department for those flights, you also would need approval by the Federal Aviation Administration. The pilots must receive clearance to enter and depart from the country where the patient is located. And it turned out, in fact, that refueling stops for the return flight were at least initially a point of contention. The State Department had to intervene to allow um, uh, the Phoenix Air to have a refueling stop on one of the islands on, on the way. These are some images provided by uh, Randy from, from his trips. This is in Liberia, and this is a patient who was too ill to walk being loaded onto the plane. And unfortunately, it lo looks like a, a baggage loader is, is being used here. Um, sorry, there we go. So now we have stepped onto US soil. We've now successfully negotiated international law, aviation and custom rules, and refueling stops. Uh, what happens now? And here's where it gets a little bit complicated, at least from this perspective of US law. We actually have two governments in charge. We have the federal government and we have the state government. But the federal government plays a very small role once the patient is inside the United States. And just to briefly summarize what that authority is, the CDC provides expert guidance and resources to state, tribal, and local health authority. It has secondary quarantine and isolation authority, which is rarely used, and it also maintains a do not board list. Here are the quarantine stations in the United States. Currently, there are proposals to fund more as a, a result of some of the shortcomings that became evident uh, with respect to screening for Ebola. There are 20 quarantine stations some um, are staffed more fully than others. Here's a diagram of uh, why quarantine stations are important, or at least why someone needs to be screening. Ebola, of course, has been devastating in West Africa, but not much of a factor in the United States. MERS, on the other and the hand, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, has been uh, of concern for quite some time. This is an estimate, or at least a diagram, that shows where those flights come from, in terms of international travel, where they're going, these are direct flights, and you can see that uh, the map is quite extensive. So the federal government, we've gone quickly over their authority because there's not much of it. Once we get to the issue of care of the patient, public health measures, including quarantine. Public health control measures are the responsibility of state and local governments. The US did have an Ebola czar, um, but really the, that person could only coordinate federal uh, government response. So health departments, state and local health departments have a Herculean task during an outbreak. They monitor quarantine and they do contact tracing. Let's focus on cost for a minute. And here is an example from Minnesota. For four months, the Minnesota Department of Public Health has uh, monitored any Entering, travel, entering persons traveling from any of the affected areas in West Africa. It has monitored all of those for 21 days. None of the 232 travelers who completed that monitoring program have developed Ebola. But it has cost the Minnesota Department of Health uh, more than $2 million just for this quarantine and observation uh, measure for 232 persons. Monitoring programs and uh, they're expensive, and we need to ask the question, does our political process provide adequate funding, especially to pre be prepared for the big one? It is hard to plan for, so how can we proceed when funding and programs are dependent on the political process? For example, 
Ebola news was everywhere prior to the November election, and then afterwards it practically disappeared. Ebola was used for election purposes and then largely forgotten, or at least one could conclude that from the lack of press attention. No resources, worst case scenario, some resources, public health department can work with that, sufficient resources. These are held hostage to other political issues. So for example, currently the Department of Homeland Security funding for the entire department is in jeopardy over a conflict about immigration. Funding for public health departments exposes a flaw in government structure and the political process in the United States, which I've written about in the context of drug-resistant tuberculosis treatment. But at bottom, we rely on good government, and since that is primarily state and local, I want to explore briefly what that authority is. So the usual civil rights and liberties that we talk about in terms of constitutional protections, they don't really apply with respect to public health, and they don't apply in the same way, at least. We are governed under a structure that was really put into place by the United States Supreme Court in 1905. This is a case known as Jacobson v. Massachusetts. It happened to be about uh, a person who did not want a mandatory smallpox vaccination, and that person lost. But here's what the Supreme Court said through Justice uh, John Marshall Harlan. A well-ordered society must be able to enforce reasonable regulations in responding to an epidemic disease which threatens the safety of its members. While the Constitution protects against tyranny, it does not afford an absolute right in each person to be, in all times and in all circumstances, wholly free from restraint. So this is giving states a lot of authority. And states have used that authority. Uh, in terms of quarantine, here's just an example of the exercise of quarantine in Texas. This is from a, a number of years ago, and I'm going to compare it with something more recent in, in Texas. But just to take a look at this, this is a typical quarantine order that's stuck on someone's house. No one shall enter or leave this house without written permission of the local health authority. And then it sets out the statutory authority uh, for that. But going to Dallas, uh, we just to remind you of the incident moving on from uh, the Emory voluntary patients, Dallas ex had an unexpected Ebola case, and it was, um, in terms of the unplanned appearance, there was uh, um, a variety of responses. This was a quarantine that was put into place by the public health officials, initially the family that had been um, surrounding the individual. They were uh, quarantined in their apartment, even though there were a lot of hazardous materials there. And that delay, the reason was given, is that they could not get, state officials, local officials, could not get a hazardous transportation permit in order to remove that. This was finally remedied. This is a friend bringing them some food. But, you know, at the beginning, this was, this was tough for a lot of officials. And that one of the attorney generals for the state of Texas basically said, well, we were working with this old structure and we think it's flexible enough to do what we need to do, uh, but we are still learning. And then here's the media scrum. This is the slide that I will end with. It is, um, here's typical state legislation and it happens to be the state of Georgia and it dates from around the time of the United States Supreme Court case that we talked about, so this is turn of the 20th century. And if you'll bear with me, I just want to read it to you quickly to emphasize a couple of points. The department and all county boards of health may require quarantine or surveillance of carriers of disease and persons exposed to or suspected of being infected with infectious disease until they are found to be free of the infectious agent or disease in question. So what I want to focus on is that you don't have to be sick. You merely have to be suspected of having been exposed. And 21 days is a long time to take away uh, someone's ability to move around, their ability to work, their ability to earn a living, um, the, the desire to avoid social ostracism, but it is uh, clearly a state power that should be used wisely, uh, and we rely on our government officials to do so. 
the fact that there is no compensation for this period, say for returning workers for three weeks, that there's no compensation is said to be because the rights of the individual have to be sacrificed to the public good. All right, I'm going to only show one slide um, and uh, then uh, talk around it. But I wanted to start with this issue of how we think about Ebola on two different levels. There, is a fun there are a number of fundamental differences between the way in which we think about public health ethics and the way in which we think about clinical and medical ethics. And sometimes these two get conf conflated some of the ethical challenges that we have around epidemics are a mistake of type. That is, we talk about population health as if we're talking about individual health, or we talk about individual health as if we're talking about population health. So very quickly, I'm gonna to try to show you conceptually what the differences are and the way in which we think about public health versus public health ethics versus clinical or medical ethics. And that'll set the stage for the comments that'll come after where I'll try very briefly to show you what some of the ethical challenges are around Ebola and epidemics, though, of course, in this short time, we can only touch on them. So the first thing is that public health involves multiple stakeholders who are, in a sense, um, your patient. The population is your patient when you're doing public health. And so you have a lot of different stakeholders involved, all of whom deserve equal attention because all are at risk in an epidemic. In a clinical encounter, your ethical responsibility is to the patient and the patient alone. The healthcare um, provider has a fiduciary legal responsibility to do what's in the best interest of that patient. And even if what they do with that patient might affect someone else, their ethical responsibility is to that individual. Secondly, Public health tends to be process oriented. What can we put in place here that will, um, uh, what processes can we put in place here to try to minimize the impact of this while clinical medical decision making is outcome oriented? What can we do to most facilitate the health goals of this patient, cure, palliative care, whatever it might be? Public health is focused on the public good. Clinical medicine is very explicitly focused on the private good. A physician who is treating you, but who is worried about the public good, is not fulfilling their ethical or legal obligation to you. Their goal should be to you as their patient and to you alone, except in very rare circumstances. If you threaten someone's life, if you have an infectious disease that might infect others, that's one thing. But for a physician, for example, to think, hmm, there's only a finite amount of resources in the world. This patient is going to take some of them. I'm going to save some of these resources for others. That's a violation of the clinical relationship, but it is very much what public health needs to think about. Public health tends to be based on prevention in most cases. The Ebola epide epidemic is an exception. When epidemics break out, it's now about stopping them. But in most cases, most public health is about prevention, while most clinical medicine is based on treatment. In fact, in the United States particularly, clinical medicine has been criticized for not focusing nearly enough on prevention and over-focusing on treatment. In public health, the government is highly involved, as we just saw in Pauli's um, uh, uh, presentation, the government sets the parameters around which public health can be exercised. In um, clinical medicine, the government, we hope, stays out of it as much as possible. There are exceptions to this, and our system is bounded by government regulations, but in that interaction, we don't want the government involved, or at least as little as possible. Public health has to accommodate cultural beliefs. And here at Rollins, you talk to people who engage in actual public health activity, and they tell you that local culture and beliefs, as I'll show you in a minute with Ebola, profound impact on how not only disease is um, uh, thought about and perpetuated in any particular culture, but what kinds of public health interventions are likely to work and what kinds are not. While clinical medicine is only about the personal beliefs of that individual, now cultural beliefs, of course, can come into it, but 
not the broader cultural beliefs. And in fact, one of the things we try to teach our medical students and other clinicians is just because this person belongs to a particular cultural group, don't assume that they have all of the beliefs of that particular group. They may not. Um, in public health, we think of collective rationing. We have a finite amount of vaccine. How do we allocate it? In the uh, clinical um, encounter, we don't want our clinicians to engage in bedside rationing. That example I gave you a minute ago where I, a I'm not a clinician, but if I were sitting on the bedside saying, hmm, how many resources am I going to allocate to this particular patient? We don't want our clinicians doing that. Uh, public health is based on an idea of justice. Right? We don't discriminate in public health saying these people are more worthy, so we'll try to save them, those we won't. Um, while clinical medicine, at least in the United States, is based more on individual rights, though justice, of course, comes into it as well. Uh, and in public health, as Polly just told us again, sometimes the uh, rights of the community trump the rights of individuals. In fact, public health is about the needs of the community, not the needs of any particular individual. While patient autonomy, of course, is what we uh, advocate and, and care about um, in clinical medicine in most cases. Public health has a kind of utilitarian, consequentialist perspective. That is, we want to try to maximize the most good for the most people as best we can, while, of course, the clinical medical idea is let's do what's in the best interest of this patient. At least that should be the orientation of the physician with many caveats. Um, public health should be about protection, protecting everyone, including minorities. We don't discriminate while in clinical medicine the patient is paramount. Finally, when public health intervenes, when it needs to go into a society and engage in some intervention, one of the things you want to do is use the least effective intervention. You don't want to intervene more than necessary to achieve your goals. And, find, and um, with clinical medicine, it isn't about that. It's about consent of the patient. So this is very briefly, as you can see, I've rushed through this. Each of these is worth a conversation. But I wanted us to get, first of all, an outline of why it is that when we think about public health ethics, we think about it differently than the way in which we think about clinical ethics. And some of the decisions that we make sometimes that seem, or, or people have, uh, comment to me, was that ethical, it's because they're applying a clinical ethical lens to a public ethical problem. All right, that's my slide, and the rest I'm going to be just talking to you about. So the tensions involved here, involved in all of this on both sides, are certain kinds of tensions such as the rights of the individual versus the rights of society. How do we balance that? Adi in, in both cases, adequate knowledge versus risk. We never have complete knowledge in a medical encounter. We never have complete knowledge in a public health encounter, and there's always some kind of risk involved, and we always are trying to balance those two things. Advocacy versus objectivity. To what degree should we be advocates for actions versus trying to keep an objective eye on what actions are right? Um, in public health, and sometimes also in clinical medicine, incentives versus mandates. So public health often argues about stopping smoking. Do we try to give people incentives to stop smoking, or do we create certain mandates that coerce their behavior? And that's true in almost any public health intervention, and it could be true sometimes in clinical interventions as well. And finally, the issue of privacy also comes in versus public need. Um, how do we balance those? So those are some of the tensions involved here, and we have precedents for the Ebola uh, outbreak. So one of the examples I like to use is flu. We've done a lot of work uh, on trying to plan for a potential flu outbreak. You know, we had this extraordinarily destructive flu ad outbreak early in the 20th century, killed 50 million people. And we keep being warned by the CDC that such an outbreak might be possible again. And so the CDC and others have done a lot of thought about how do we handle such an epidemic ethically. And there are some really interesting issues there. So for example, if, you, if we had an, a finite amount of vaccine, how should we allocate it? Uh, sh there are many different philosophies you could take. Save those most at risk. Well, it turns out that in the flu, very young children are, are at risk, but older children are at less risk 
than really young children, and then in some cases are at less risk than healthy adults because the flu turns your immune system against you, and the stronger your immune system is, the more at risk you are, right? except for people with exceptionally weak immune systems. So the people in the middle are at the least risk, and how would a society respond to, I'm sorry, the people in the middle are at the most risk, so how would a society respond to giving flu vaccine to people that seem the healthiest if they were the most at risk? Or perhaps you put children and young people first and you don't care who's at most risk. Or perhaps you say what allocation of this vaccine would have the best effect on society. We don't care about individuals particularly. Or you say, okay, we have a finite amount of vaccine. Let's use a lottery system. Whoever gets the highest number gets vaccinated. Or we could say first come, first serve. You get to CVS before me, you get the last shot. The point is that all of these are, and there are more, of course, are strategies to allocate. And there are ethically uh, valid reasons to argue any of them. So when it comes to epidemics, how we're going to allocate resources becomes a very interesting ethical problem. And of course, it's exactly the problem that first raised its head in many ways in the Ebola uh, situation, when I soon as it was decided to try this experimental therapy on Dr. Brantley, uh, I started getting calls. And there were two kinds of questions that these media wanted to know. Question number one, is it okay to use an experimental um, vaccine in a situation like this? And number two, why are we giving it to, the, to Dr. Brantley? So let's take the second one first. Was it ethical to give this experimental vaccine to Dr. Brantley? Some people, I had many media calls where they said, is it fair to give this vaccine that might save the life to the wealthy, white, privileged Americans and not to someone from Sierra Leone or Liberia where people are dying by the thousands? And my response was, what would, you, what would happen if we sent this experimental vaccine over to Liberia and it killed the first person we put it into? Then you'd be saying, oh, once again, the United States is experimenting on, on you know, people, minorities in developing nations um, who are now guinea pigs for American vaccines, right? So this was a lose-lose, right? There was no right ethical choice here. In fact, the right ethical choice was to give it to Dr. Brantley for a number of reasons, not because he was white and privileged, but because he was here where he could be observed in very sophisticated medical situations. There was a very limited amount of this vaccine. We still don't know if it works, really. Um, and so it was an opportunity to try it here. The second issue of um, whether to try an experimental vaccine at all was more complicated. The World, he World Health Organization um, had already had a long uh, conversation. They put together a panel of experts to ask the question, in a situation like this, is it okay to use an experimental treatment on a um, person in, in an epidemic. And they reached a consensus that it was, in fact, okay to use unproven interventions, which is the word they use, even if its effectiveness or its side effects or complications were unknown. The Food and Drug Administration also agreed with that and permitted this small biopharma company to distribute this product um, that had been put on hold at the time because of concerns about side effects of uh, ZMAP. Um, however, both panels said that it was very important in these situations, as the WHO put it, to do an ethical analysis uh, and a discussion to try to come to some conclusions or at least reach some tentative decisions about um, distributing this into communities uh, and among countries when we really don't know that much uh, about it and when other interventions are being developed um, and when there certainly wasn't going to be enough to reach demand in the short term no matter what we did. The WHO did make one interesting comment about this, which is that there's a moral obligation on the part of the people who get these drugs to allow themselves to be studied. This is something that bioethicists have talked about for a very long time. Do you have an obligation? Everyone in this room has benefited from modern medicine. You've gone to the doctor, you've gotten a drug, you've gotten vaccinated, you've gotten shots. Does that thereby 
impose upon you an ethical obligation to involve yourself in research, having yourselves been the benefit of other people's voluntary research in the past. Every drug you've ever taken has been tested on human beings who volunteered, we hope, for that study. And the WHO, said, and, and bioethics has always argued, well, you may have a broad ethical obligation in some general sense, but never a specific ethical obligation. But the WHO actually said you have a specific ethical obligation if you are going to receive a very rare vaccine for a rare disorder to allow yourself to be studied. Um, so those are some of the questions around allocation of a vaccine. And now I'm going to just mention quickly a few of the other ethical challenges here uh, without talking in much depth about them, just throw them out as as issues so that perhaps in the Q&A we can talk about them a little more. The first is the issue of trust. All of the interventions that we try to do around Ebola in the developing nation are going to be based on issues of trust. We saw examples of distrust all over this uh, event all over Western Africa, right? We saw uh, the belief that people who were spraying disinfectant were actually spreading Ebola. We saw a group of people act uh, go into a clinic and destroy it because they thought when the healthcare workers come, Ebola comes, right? They have the causative direction in the wrong direction, right? The healthcare workers are coming because Ebola's there. They don't bring it, but they destroyed it. So trust becomes very, very important around this. On this side, too, very quick anecdote, I wrote a piece for CNN right after Ebola happened, and the day that I was writing it, Donald Trump tweeted this tweet about um, how important it, uh, Dr. Brantley was on his way in, and tr Trump tweeted, this is a failure of political leadership, keep him out. So in my, in my uh, article, I mentioned that, and uh, it was published on CNN, then it was reposted all over by other news sources with the title, Wolpe colon, Trump shut up. <laughs> Google it. Okay, so trust, trust is important in both, I, I was very careful walking out to my car that day, but um, trust is important in both sides, not just in Western Africa, but here too, that, you know, that was a failure of trust as well. Uh, Polly already talked about quarantine, so I won't say anything about that. I will say, though, that I sit um, on the Emory Ebola Task Force, and one of the things that we did talk about was what is the ethical obligation of Emory to its own healthcare workers should they go and volunteer to uh, go to Western Africa and, and, and give their time and effort on their own time to trying to help uh, treat people there. Then they come back, maybe they took their week's vacation to do that, but now they're quarantined for three weeks. Should we pay them? You know, what is our obligation? We are a system that believes in helping uh, others and, and we have highly trained people that we're very proud of. Should we not support them in, through that endeavor? And in fact, we will support them through that endeavor. And then the uh, last two just points I'll throw out for, for talking is we need to talk about ourselves. What is, it, what is the public preparedness for epidemics in this country? And the answer is none, right? We don't know what to do. We're going to start being told once the epidemic is underway. And when you talk about the issue of panic or planning, what's going to happen in the United States is panic because we're not doing any planning, right? We just have this attitude, it's not going to happen here. That's our attitude as the public. We don't believe CDC when it tells us to get our flu shots and lots of people don't get them. And then one day the epidemic's gonna hit and there's gonna be panic here. Um, and so there is a, there is a big difference in um, life between the theoretical discussion of the ethics of disease and the lived experience of it. And one of the things that I think is really important and one of the things I think that we at the Center for Ethics try to be very cognizant of is that ethical theory is a very different thing than ethics on the ground. And you can have the most wonderful theories in the world and then you step into Western Africa or you have the most wonderful theories in the world and you step into um, the emergency room. And it's really important when we think about planning that we think about it soberly, realistically. We think about the real ways in which people behave and not sort of wonderful models of, of ethical upstandedness. 
Um, and that's the only way we're actually going to prepare for things in a way that will have real results when they inevitably do happen. Thanks. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.